trouble. He'll fight for freedom wherever there is trouble. G.I. Joe is here. Yo, Joes, time for another real American hero history lesson. On to the history of G.I. Joe 1984 edition. Let's go for it! <laughs> With the success of the previous two years, the trend of all new molds for the figures continued, and even 20 figures were released. Seven Joes and four Cobras on card, eight vehicle drivers, and another mail-away exclusive. 11 new Joe and Cobra vehicles were released, along with some battle stations and battlefield accessories. The first mail-away vehicle, and since all of those weapons and accessories were so easy to lose outside, Hasbro also deployed the much-needed battle gear. Let's start off with the vehicles. It wouldn't be G.I. Joe without a tank. And the slugger proved a Joe tank could pack a big punch while also burning rubber. And since this cannon brought the lightning down on Cobra, it was only fitting that it was driven by the Joe codenamed Thunder. Yahoo! Music to my ears! 84 was the year Joe and Cobra got their feet really wet with an assortment of water-based vehicles. On the Joe side, there was the Shark. Submersible, high-speed attack and reconnaissance craft. Hey, that doesn't actually sound too bad for an 80s toy acronym. Uh, it's all a little too pat, you know? Yeah, I agree. I'm actually suspicious as to why that acronym makes perfect sense. Leader Joe to Deep Six, are you in position? Deep Six and Torpedo in position and ready to provide backup assistance. Anyways, in the cockpit was the rambunctious Deep Six. Yo Joe, or words to that effect. The shark was actually a two for one. It was a submersible and also a flying fighter. And the other water-based Joe vehicle was also not just restricted to the water. It's the big boy, the Killer Whale. Warrior, hovering, assault, launching, envoy. Yeah, that's more typical of 80s toy acronyms. Head for the whale! And the captain of this giant vessel was Cutter. Yo, Joe! This thing had an amazing number of play features. It had cannons, turret guns, depth charges, six missiles, as well as seven and eight, Patreon tribe in-joke, an ejecting sea sled, fire sea sled! An opening ramp and cargo area to hold troops. Working propellers. And a little scooter. It's an amazing toy. One of the biggest and most fun from any toy line of the 80s. It's also really fragile. So many different parts on this thing can break so easily. The hinges for the ramps, the propeller shrouds, vanes. If you're looking for a killer whale, good luck finding one in perfect condition. I'm tempted to let you try it, but it's impossible. The great thing about the whale is that it actually floats, and it's big and broad enough to not capsize in rough waters, unlike some smaller Joe boats. And like the shark, it wasn't restricted to just the water. Since it was a hovercraft, the whale could travel on land as well. <laughs> It's deceptively big. I never would have thought the Joe Hovercraft was one of the biggest vehicles produced in the line, but I'm still amazed by the size of it to this day. It's so big that it still looks big next to the USS flag. The whale ensures that the mission not only gets accomplished, Whale to Joe base! Mission accomplished with gusto. The gorgeous Sky Striker got some air support with the Skyhawk, the vertical takeoff and landing one-man fighter. Anniversary edition standing in for the vintage one here. A little air support for the lady, boys! Since not everyone could afford giant vehicles like the Sky Striker and Whale, it was nice to have lower price point vehicles like the Skyhawk and Shark to keep the air and sea defended from Cobra on a budget. 
The final new-ish Joe vehicle sold in stores for 1984 was the Vamp Mark II. Yo, Joe! It may appear to be just a recolor of the original Vamp, but I never saw this as a lazy repaint. Adding a missile rack and removable door and roof panels differentiated it enough from the original to warrant its existence for me. Plus it came with a recolor of clutch, this time in tan fatigues. Well, I need to shave! Which went along nicely with tan grunt from the year before. It would have been nice to see all of the original 82 Joes reissued in tan uniforms, but the trend stopped with clutch. Now he tells me. Cobra got a great assortment of heavy metal in 84, starting with the snake of the sky, the Cobra Rattler. Cobra leader to G.I. Joe, land your plane or face the consequences. Even though it was smaller than the Sky Striker, the Rattler and its pilot, Wild Weasel, had no problem keeping up as well as evading thanks to the pivoting VTOL engines. Wild Weasel to Cobra Commander, mission accomplished. But not with gusto. You are testing my patience, G.I. Joe. Sorry, moving on. The Cobras got some more air support with the Cobra Claw one of the most affordable vehicles of 84. Cobra! Cobra! Covert Light Aerial Weapon. Hey, that acronym's actually not too bad either. The claw could either be piloted remotely, or you could remove the bomb in the middle and attach it to this slithering sneak's back and use it as a jetpack. We shall see how G.I. Joe likes the bite of a sneak's fangs. Cobra got a set of wheels with a stinger. Which looked more like a lazy repaint of the Vamp 2 than the Vamp 2 looked of the Vamp 1. Same removable panels on the stinger, but at least it had a new set of missiles in the back. And came with a driver. Since I don't have the vintage one, this is the anniversary edition standing in. The stinger got some backup, literally, with the ASP. Assault System Pod. Eh, not bad. It could either be towed or transformed into attack mode. And the rest of the Cobra vehicles took it to the Joes in the water. There was the Water Moccasin. Cobra's much smaller answer to the Whale Hovercraft, with the Scholar piloting it, Copperhead. You all need more brains! Anniversary Edition standing in for the vintage again. And there was the Chameleon Swamp Skier with the Master of Disguise, Zartan. I don't know if anyone actually bought the Swamp Skier for the Swamp Skier. I always thought it was just a cool bonus for getting Zartan. Not only did Zartan have a mask you could use to disguise him, his skin turned blue with exposure to the sunlight. Oh, oh, sunlight! I hate sunlight! Or exposure to Gung Ho's cooking. Sears received another exclusive, this time it was a two-pack of the original Vamp, no driver this time, and Hal Laser, for those who missed out during the first two years, or wanted to add to the motor pool. The final vehicle for 84 was a mail-away exclusive, the Manta, Marine Assault Nautical Transport, air-driven. Yay. It was a surfboard with a sail, machine gun, and missile on it. The cool feature is that it could be disassembled and carried in a backpack once the Joe hit shore. Three battle stations were released in 84. There was the Mountain Howitzer, which could be attached to the trailer hitch on Joe vehicles, the Bivouac, a tent with a rocket launcher, and the Watchtower, perfect for snipers, er, sorry, I meant night spotters, to keep an eye out for Cobra. And three battlefield accessories were released to give Joe more firepower in their fight for freedom. The machine gun defense unit, rock and roll's favorite hangout place, the missile defense unit, and short fuse's favorite hideout, the mortar defense unit. Hanging on the pegs weren't just the figures this year. Released on card with bubble was the second set of battle gear. Extra weapons, helmets, and backpacks in case you lost your originals. And they were recolored versions, so you'd always remember the price of fun outside with G.I. Joe. This set also included stands, which finally allowed you to stand your Joes up securely. Just stand there. Not played with. Doing nothing. Kind of like how they are now that we're all grown up and don't play with our toys anymore. What a load of malarkey! Seven new Joes hit the pegs in 84. 
previous year saw him as a mail-away exclusive, but now all Joe fans could get him at their local toy department. First Sergeant Hauser, G.I. Joe. My friends call me Duke. Along with Optimus Prime and Cabbage Patch dolls, Duke was the first toy I vividly remember having a real tough time tracking down at a toy store. He just never seemed to be hanging on the pegs whenever I'd go. But one day, on my way to the Joe section, a store employee was putting out fresh Joes on the pegs right out of the case. And I remember frantically searching through the pegs for the Joe's new leader. There, at the very back of the highest peg I could reach at age 8, was Duke. You sure get a kick out of me! And I sure did. After I took every single figure off that peg to get to the last one in the back, boy, figures are sure designed better these days. Duke holds a special place in my heart. He's cut from the same cloth as Optimus Prime, Lion-O, He-Man, and Luke Skywalker. He may not be the most witty Joe, but he's a rock. A pillar of virtue. The voice of action to move forward and never give up till the fight's won. Move! Hit him hard and hit him fast! He delegates some of his duties to Flint the following year and step aside as commander in 86 when Hawk returned, but for me, Duke is G.I. Joe. Yo, Joe! And always represented what the real American hero, as well as all soldiers, were all about in tone, attitude, intensity, and action. So let's show him what G.I. Joe can do. And as great as he was, he knew he couldn't do it on his own. Nobody can fight Cobra alone. That's why there's a Joe team. Duke was backed up with another one of my favorite Joes, Blowtorch. While I wasn't a fan of the bright colors used in the 90s figures, I loved the original Blowtorch. He really stood out amid all the OD green and camo. And that's why it worked. He was the only one. It's a bit much when every figure has that type of bright color scheme. But it worked for Blowtorch, especially since he looked like a giant flame. It was pretty funny on the show though how he couldn't use his flamethrower directly on the Cobras. It always had to be redirected to something else. Nobody gets shot or burned. Where's Rakundo? Deep in the jungle, Duke. Since Joe's had quickly become the outside toy for kids, it was natural to release a jungle trooper. Cutting a path to get us out of this jungle. Then there was Roadblock, the heavy machine gunner with Ma Deuce. Hey man, I'm a gourmet. Right, move over, gung ho. Roadblock could dish out the lead and the grub. My ribs are the greatest, and that's a fact. Joe beat Cobra, and that's where it's at. Phew, are these history videos getting longer? Oh, relax. This can't go on for more than a couple weeks. Next up was a Joe who looked right at home in the Sky Striker. It's the Halo Jumper, Ripcord. Yo, Joe! Halo, or Halo, stands for High Altitude, Low Opening. They're paratroopers who wait until the last possible second to pull their chute to avoid detection. Ripcord, what are you waiting for? Pop your chute! Not yet! Pull the cord, you maniac! It takes big brass guts to do that kind of thing on a regular basis. Wish me happy landings! May the road rise to meet you, Ripcord. Just not too quickly. 84 was the first year Joe figures started coming with animal companions. Hey, cut that out! There was the canine handler, Mutt, with the adorable Mutt junkyard. Mutt? Who you calling Mutt? I'm Mutt! That's what I said. Bullets and missiles weren't the only way to fight Cobra anymore. Now there were flames and teeth. <laughs> then there was Spirit, the tracker, along with the other first Joe animal, Freedom the Eagle. Spirit was the Joe's first foray into a character who was a little more mystical, honoring the real native American heroes of North America. He also had an attitude that would make Optimus Prime proud. In my mind, there is only the possible. Then there were the Cobras. Uh oh, reinforcements. Starting with Spirit's arch nemesis on the Sunbow cartoon. <gasps> <gasps> Equally mystic, 
Storm Shadow. Many of these figures came with cool weapons. But the ninja is a weapon! Behold! I enjoyed his rivalry with Spirit on the cartoon, but for me, the true Storm Shadow existed in Larry Hama's comics, where he was a clan brother of Snake Eyes, and eventually left Cobra to join G.I. Joe. But that's a story for the 1988 episode. Rounding out the forces of evil were a pair of Cobras with penchants for big explosions, Scrap Iron with Missile Launcher, and Firefly, the Saboteur. Firefly! Strike! And Cobra received their first female member in 1984 with the lovely and deadly Baroness. Oh, and another mail away figure was offered in 84, which was the first figure I ever sent away for in the mail. Commander, your hood, put it on. This is my original hooded Cobra Commander, a repaint of the original Cobra Commander in darker blue with a soft plastic hood. I had never been able to track down the original Fang Face in stores, but... Give me no butts! <clears throat> However, I was able to collect enough flag points to send away for this version. So much the better. Yeah, I actually prefer this version. Something about being able to see the whites of his eyes. It always came across as more intense on the show than the blank chrome dome. Plus, the navy uniform with gold accents made him look more distinguished. This figure was so special to me that when it came time to give away a bunch of my original Joes in the 90s to kids who could put them to better use than I could at the time, I looked at this one and thought, Ah, that will keep. Sure glad I did. And I'm sure glad you decided to check out the History of G.I. Joe 1984 edition. Oh, trying to improve your image, huh? What are you talking about? I always say thank you. Attitude of gratitude, Top. Thanks for watching. The response has been astounding. Glad you're all enjoying these as much as I am making them. Now what? Patreon reminder. If you'd like to support the channel and receive some awesome awards, join the Patreon tribe at patreon.com slash michaelmercy. How about a little friendly persuasion? Now, now, Roadblock. We're not going to force anyone to join. For those who want to, though, there are various levels or ranks depending on what you can contribute and each one will get you more cool rewards. We must dwell on this. It's also a fun and respectful community. No trolling, no bickering, and nitpicking. Just people who love their hobby and are enjoying it alongside other fans. Just like we used to do way back when. They need something to spark them up! How about weekly videos that only Patreon members can watch? I'm not greedy, so just one dollar will get you access to the Patreon-only videos. They're my way of thanking the people who are contributing to the costs of the channel and help keep it going. I think that deserves a thank you, don't you? My guess. Awesome. If you've got a Joe 84 memory you'd like to share, fire away in the comments, okay? And to join the tribe, hit subscribe. Say it with me now. Yo, Joe!